We welcome you again to our Scripture Roundtable discussion series as we are talking about the New Testament and the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm Brent Topp from Religious Education here at BYU, and joining us from the Religion Faculty are Professors Camille Franck, Ray Huntington, and David Whitchurch, all from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Today we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount as we set up last time talking about the calling of the Twelve. And we're going to deal with Matthew chapter 5 in this uh, in our discussion today. As we turn to Matthew chapter 5, we see it uh, starting out, but uh, it really doesn't give us all of the background that we I think we need to have to discuss this chapter. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Now, last time we talked a little bit about disciples versus apostles, but why don't we set the stage for this uh, this sermon? It's certainly not just a typical teaching uh, sermon by any means. He's not just sitting along the side of the lake and having people come and listen in on it. What's unique about this particular sermon, and why is it that he's gone up into a mountain? I'll I'll give okay. some of um, thoughts I've had on that. I think, especially when we see this written in Matthew, where we get this lengthy sermon and how it's likened to Law of Moses, mm -hmm. um, that it seems like he's inviting us to see it in contrast to the lesser law, where Moses went up into a high mountain and received a lesser law. That actually is the higher law brought down literally and figuratively to the level of the people. In contrast, this sermon, the Savior is going to give the ultimate promise of being uh, that we can become perfect. Um, as he, as the Father, is perfect. And I think the, the imagery that he gives here is come up the mountain, not having the, the law brought down, but having disciples, those that are willing to make these covenants and follow him, come to the top of the mountain with him and become like him. I think, too, you alluded to it as you started. It, it says that uh, as he goes up into the mountain, he says when he set, his disciples came unto him. This is the inner circle. Mm -hmm. This isn't the multitude that he's addressing. Uh, these are his pupils, his learners that he's about to teach. So what role do the apostles that were called have to do at this, uh, at this sermon? You know, Brand, I think one of the things is that, that's taking place is um, if, if you look at the uh, harmony of the Gospels, it, it does appear the apostles have been called and set apart. Um, I see this as a training meeting for the apostles, and it makes it really clear as you get farther into the to the Sermon on the Mount, where we have a, a JST edition which says that uh, this information that the apostles were to receive is the information that they're to then go out and teach the people. So it, it, this is a this is a time when when the Savior is, as Camille said, uh, he's introducing the new law to them, the higher law of the gospel. Um, and I, that's not for novices. Oh no, no, this is for people who are. Um, but would you educated. say there were more than just the twelve there? Oh, I think so. Okay. Uh, I think we have individuals that, are, the, that will soon be called uh, members of the Quorum of Seventy, which they clearly had in the New Testament. And, uh, but I think it's, uh, I think is what uh, <coughs> Brother Whitchurch pointed out is I think we've got some serious disciples here, right. yeah. because, and I think that's, you know, uh, Camille mentioned the idea of going up to a mountain and the symbolism of a new law being given from the mount and bringing the people up into the presence of God to some degree. But it's also, I think he's going into this high mountain, wherever it is, wherever it is, uh, as far as the locale. You don't just passively go to listen. You had to make the effort to come to listen to him. They were coming to him, and he's pre presenting to them some new doctrine that they haven't really had before. Which makes, wherever the location is, a, an exceedingly high mountain. Right. It, it becomes the highest point on the face of the earth. Right. You know, the prophet uh, Jeremiah in the Old Testament, uh, in, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses uh, 31 through 34, um, it, it, it literally was a prophecy in which he said, there will come a time when the new law will be written on your heart and not on stone, meaning a replacement of the Mosaic law, uh, a, a new law, a higher law, written in the hearts of the people. And that is this law that's being taught now. Well, I think we see that as we uh, get into the scriptures. It's clearly a call from a lower law to a higher form of righteousness yeah. that we see. I, I was just, as you were talking about the Twelve, as you're reading in the Book of Mormon, the account, there, there's a place where he gets to, uh, it's 3 Nephi 13, verse 25, 
when he specifically turns to the twelve and begins to address them. And so as we look at the disciples that are there, certainly there are those we assume who are the twelve uh, and others. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a mixed message and then it becomes our um, opportunity to try to sort out some of these messages in terms of even that inner circle that he's addressing. Because there seems to be something as we get into it that is specifically directed to the twelve as versus wonderful disciple. Well, and I think Ray's pointed that out, that JST makes it crystal clear because when he then gives him that charge and he says not only in verse 3 he says, blessed are they that shall believe on me and again more blessed are they who shall believe on your words. I think he's speaking specifically to apostles who are sent forth at that point. Well, let's get in and look at this. Uh, let's look at the probably the most familiar to all the world in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, begins in verse 3 with starting out with the blessed are the poor in spirit. We call these the Beatitudes and most uh, Christian people and Bible believing people are familiar with the Beatitudes but what is a Beatitude and where does that come from and why is uh, why are these next several verses even significant to us? You know, your footnote helps you out a lot on that. Um, it, it says as you look down at 3 in the, in the footnote the Latin Beatus is the basis of the English beatitude, meaning to be fortunate, to be happy, or to be blessed. And mm. as I teach these, rather than just talk about state of blessedness, this is a means whereby we can gain happiness or be happy. And it, and it almost seems ironic as you read through some of these. Uh, for example, you look at the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, if you reword that, fortunate are those who are poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. Or even the second one, you know, happy are they that mourn. Mm -hmm. well, it doesn't seem like the two go together very right. well. And yet as you begin to contemplate how these uh, interrelate to one another, you can begin to see some progression as he teaches about well, how to state become of, happy. In the state of blessedness, though, there has to be something else involved in these next several verses than what meets the eye. Because I don't think that you're blessed just because you mourn. Well, and, well, and I think that key comes in the Book of Mormon. Okay. There's and in the Joseph Smith translation as well. First, he begins his teaching of this higher law that is a sacred, remarkable teaching, and I think begins by reinforcing the idea we can't do this without the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he begins, "Blessed are the poor in spirit." It is not blessed to or happy or fortunate to be lacking in spirit. Right. The Book of Mormon, the Joseph Smith translation, inserts the key there, who come unto me or who come unto Christ. Yeah, and even the previous verses, if you remember, emphasize baptism and receiving the right. gift of the Holy Ghost. So we're clearly talking in a gospel context. That's right. And so here you come to him when you recognize you're lacking spirit, that you need spirit. And then in that progression that David's talking about eventually brings us then to uh, verse 6, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's the, doc it's the Book of Mormon and the Joseph Smith translation that helped us again, that's when you're actually filled with that which we have yearned for from the beginning, the spirit. Mm -hmm.